Hi, and welcome to the Victory Church Podcast. We're so glad you could join us. If this ministry has impacted you in any way, we'd love to hear all about it. Please send us an email at share at victorychurchatl.org. We pray this message will speak to your heart. Before I get into the proclamation of God's word, I need to honor a very special person in my life and in this church who I would not be able to stand here week in and week out in strength if it was not for this person after my relationship with Jesus, my safe place, the rock of my home mother of my children who celebrated a birthday on Friday. I honor the first lady of our church and my wife. Friday, my wife celebrated her birthday, and I took that day to really just observe my wife, <clears throat> and as I watched her, I had memories of when we met back in our 20s, when she was kind of really lost and a little ratchet, <laughs> but it's been over a decade and a half decade and a half of marriage and as I sat and watched my wife on Friday I observed her beauty and not 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 the beauty you see but I sat back and watched the beauty of her character as she played with the children and sat at the head of our table I sat back and watched her she has become a crown of glory for my heart and for my head and for our home I thought about her growth and maturity and her faith, that my wife is a far better Christian than I am, and her heart is far more pure than mine. As I sat back and observed my wife's beauty, I thought about how far and how fast God has brought her. She's grown so much in wisdom, that she's a fountain of wisdom that some people don't even tap because they don't even know, and others don't even have the common sense to know what's there. A woman of great virtue, character. My wife is probably the purest heart that I know. A far better believer than I am. I pray that some of her virtues that God would give me that I still do not yet have. A calm under pressure. Her ability to just love and let things roll off. I mean, she is amazing. Man, I, I sat back and I, I looked at my wife and I said, wow, this woman is getting better with age. She just brings glory to our home. And I know for myself and for our children, our home would be a mess if she was not there. And what a lot of you don't know is that this church would not be where it is today if it was not for her efforts behind the scene, which I do not see. Her administrative leadership, her logistical leadership, her strategic leadership, and her stewardship of the finances of this house. We would not be where we are if it wasn't for that wisdom operating behind the scenes. And I would not be able to stand here every Sunday if she was not cultivating an atmosphere at home that allows my heart to flourish. And that when I'm grieved, I have a safe place to lay my head after my prayer closet. If she wasn't faithful in that area, I would not be able to do this faithfully every single week. So I honor you. Thank you for all the sacrifices you have made so that I could stand here. You've given up your whole life so I can stand here. Honor you for that. And don't nobody say nothing when you see her blessed. Her, 
husband and her children rise to call her blessed. <clears throat> Unfortunate are those that don't tap your wisdom. I thank you for your wisdom. This week is also uh, Thanksgiving week before I get into the proclamation of God's word. And then in a few days, a lot of us will, will eat, we'll be with family, some of us will be alone. I know that this week will bring happiness for some and for others it will bring, it will bring hard feelings, tough memories. And um, my wife and I sat down and did a talk about this week and what we feel like you should focus on in this week, it's on the last episode of a podcast we do together called Real Talk. It's available on every streaming platform. We drop a new teaching the first Monday of every month. And in the teaching for this month, we talked about something that I think everyone in this room should focus on this week, whether you are single or married, whether you have family, whether you're traveling or you're going to remain in Atlanta, everyone should focus on the subject of this talk. And I want to encourage you to listen to that. Uh, this week. Um, also, too, I want to just give a uh, just a shout out to um, some of our online people who write us every week. To my brother Nathaniel, I don't know what city you're in, but we, I got your message this week. Shout out to you wherever you're watching. Uh, he called me his online pastor. I'm honored for that. I pray you do have a local fellowship where you belong because every believer is called to a local gathering. Um, but, but I'm honored to be your online pastor, and just this should be just a supplement to whatever you're getting at your local church, but it should not be primary. For a day is coming where technology would try to replace the Word of God, but I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. For God called us to gather, and that he said we should do that as often as possible as we see the day of Jesus re returning coming near. We should gather as often as possible. Celebrate you. Uh, also, shout out to Melissa, um, uh, who wrote us this week from Australia. No, Queensland, New Zealand. Shout out to you, Melissa, in Queensland, New Zealand. Thank you for watching from the other side of the globe. It's because of the generosity of people here in Atlanta. You're able to see this message and so we celebrate you and we thank you. Can y'all help me just celebrate our online family? And for everyone who is a guest in the room, welcome to Victory Church. Welcome to our 1130 gathering. And welcome to week five of a teaching series through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. It is a prophetic book for us in the life and history of our church. It is the third installment of a prophetic message that I believe God is speaking to us from commission to what he said to us on our anniversary, to the Holy Spirit giving me a strict instruction to teach this book because he's calling us to build together and to greater buy-in in this season. Now, last week, uh, I preached to you what I thought was the most important message in this series about opposition that comes from outside forces and how we need to be aware that we have an enemy who's unseen, who stirs up conflict and strife in our life. But I'm going to make a disclaimer now that what I'm about to preach to you is the most difficult message in this series. So last week was the most important. This week it is the most difficult. It is the one that is the most painful, but it is the subject matter of the text. We can't go around it. We can't skip over it. It is the next section of our text. And it is the most difficult section, I think, of the entire book of Nehemiah. Okay. So I know you're not going to shout me down. And I know you're not going to say amen, but that's okay because I'm not preaching for your applause. But my prayer is that this word, as difficult as it may be, would be a blessing to you, even if it hurts you. Watch. 
because everyone needs this word. So I'm going to take Nehemiah chapter 5 and I'm going to give it a subject matter. And I'm going to call it fellowship or friction. I'm going to try, Kenny. Fellowship or friction. And even as you stare at that title on the screen, it speaks of two different realities. For some of us, it speaks of two different realities in a marriage. It speaks of two different realities in relationships. It can speak of two different realities in a business, two different realities on a team, two different realities in a ministry or organization, two different realities. And the truth of the matter is, whichever reality we experience, it is contingent upon the hearts of the people involved. And so we're going to dig into Nehemiah chapter 5, fellowship of friction. Holy Spirit of God, I pray you would minister to our hearts right now. Father God, I pray you would deliver us from being sermon junkies on cotton candy. <clears throat> and that we would long for the sincere milk of your word, even the difficult parts of your word, that we may grow thereby. Father God, in this room right now, our sons and daughters who need this word, people watching across America and in other countries who need this word, we pray, Father, it would fall on good ground and it would bear fruit in the lives of your children. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Fellowship or friction. I want to start this message by drawing your attention to a very powerful quote from one of my mentors and my pastor, Dr. Darius Daniels, in his new book. And the quote says this, your greatest joy and greatest pain will come from the same place. Your greatest joy and your greatest pain will come from the same place. If we read that question with wisdom, then the next question is, then where is that place that brings our greatest joy and our greatest pain? The source of that place is our relationships. And for the purpose of this message, more specifically, our covenant relationships, our relationships with those who are of the family of God. <clears throat> One of the greatest gifts that God will ever give you or I is our covenant relationships. The relationships he grants to us once we enter into his kingdom. When our covenant relationships are done well, they can be vehicles of blessings and open doors. For God oftentimes will open up doors of blessing in our life through our covenant relationships. They are bridges into other seasons and blessings. When done well, our covenant relationships can be shortcuts to success. For the purpose of a godly mentor is to help lessen your learning curve. When done well, our covenant relationships can be a source of strength, comfort, and help. For when we find ourselves in times of pain and suffering, we lean on the shoulders of our covenant relationships. When done well, our covenant relationships can be vessels of virtue. For where we have good covenant relationships, we talk to these people, and when we leave their presence, we feel alive. We feel encouraged. We feel uplifted. We feel like they have added to our lives. Just the opposite, sometimes we deal with vampire personalities, that when we talk to these people, we leave their presence drained. We leave their presence tired. We leave their presence discouraged, and we leave their presence weary. And it's not so much about the person all the time, but also about our perspective. But when covenant relationships are done poorly, like Dr. Daniel said, they are the source 
of great pain. And my brothers and sisters, as much as I hate to confess this, the truth of the matter is, is that there are few pains more painful than church pain. Few pains more painful than pain from brothers and sisters in the faith. That is pain caused by people who are supposed to espouse the same values and virtues as the Lord Jesus Christ. That if we are reading the same Bible, and if we are filled with the same spirit, and if we're submitted to the same Lord, that is a more painful pain. And there are few pains more painful than pain among covenant relationships. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, this is where we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah was working a government job, hears about the suffering of his people, travels back to his homeland with resources, creates a group of people, a team rallied around a common cause and vision, and they set out to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem for the purpose of safety, restoration of the name of God, and the welfare of the Jewish people. In our last chapter, we saw that as they build, they came up against opposition from external forces. We used that chapter to talk about opposition, and especially opposition that comes from demonic forces. But now in chapter 5, there is a shift, my brothers and sisters, from external opposition to a far more egregious evil that we see arising in Nehemiah chapter 5. It begins with the conflict. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and our daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We are mortgaging our fields, this is tough, our vineyards, this is tough, and our homes just to get grain. Imagine putting your home on a second mortgage just to buy groceries. That's a hard knock life. And still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's taxes, our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless. I mean, that is really, really tough when you feel like you are helpless in a circumstance or situation. That some of us know what it is to be in a circumstance where nobody can get us out except God. He said, we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. My brothers and sisters, historically, this was a crisis of epic proportion in the lives and the conditions of the Jewish people. Hundreds of them, remember, had come from Babylonian captivity, seven years, and had traveled back to a city that was laying now in ruins. The walls are destroyed. The economy is destroyed. The people now are laying there in trouble. With what little hopes and strength that they had, they rallied themselves together to build a wall that was going to take a massive amount of effort. We know from from Nehemiah chapter 4 that they also suffered fatigue, that at this point the people were tired and the people were weary, that even in Nehemiah chapter 4 they were saying, we're not even sure if we could finish this. The conditions are harsh, and I have to imagine they probably tested to the limit the faith and the patience of the people. And in the face of all of this that they was already enduring, Now the people who were less fortunate amongst those brothers and sisters, those Jews, were now enduring a more harsher evil. They were being crushed under the weight of their own brothers and sisters. Historically, you remember the city now is surrounded, watch, by enemy forces. And if you know anything about ancient Near East or history, you understand that if people wanted to starve or sack a city, they would just surround a city with their army. Once a city is surrounded, everybody watch, goods, services, workers, and food cannot flow into that city. 
So armies would just camp out around the city until everybody inside began to starve and cannibalize each other. So now workers can't get in and out from the countryside. Watch. Food can't flow into the city. Grain can't flow into the city. Support can't flow into the city. Social services, WIC, all that stuff can't flow into the city. And now what we have is an economic collapse inside Jerusalem. And we have now, watch, a famine that grew inside the land. And now amongst this economic tragedy, you have some Jews that are wealthy and a great amount of Jews who are struggling and who are poor. Now some of you, you hear that, but it doesn't really move your heart. So let me give you a modern example of what this would feel like. So this would be akin to Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta Airport has completely shut down. Every trucking route on 75 and 85 has been closed because of military forces in Georgia or military forces in South Carolina and Florida. Watch. All goods, services, resources, WIC, welfare, all of it completely shuts down inside the city. You get fired from your job. Your last paycheck was your last paycheck. You have a family at home. Watch. Now the fridge goes empty. Your cabinets, they go empty. Your store and your basement, everything you have goes empty. Now your family is hungry and believe in God for help. Now bills are piling up. Eviction notices come for your home. Eviction notices come for everything you own. You got stuff in the mail, they're coming for your car, they're coming for your apartment, they're coming for everything that you own, and on top of all of that, your children are crying and they are hungry. The only people now that have resources to help you inside the city, watch, are wealthy Christians that attend the same church that you attend, and you go to them for help, and they say, listen, I'll give you $100 to get through the week, but I'm going to charge you 25% interest on that dollar. How would that make you feel if in your time of weakness and vulnerability that people you loved and served with was not there for you when you was in trouble? Man, it's one thing when people love you when everything is going good, but you really find out who's for you when you find yourself in a jam, right? And so now imagine you sang on the worship team together. You served in the parking lot together. You sang in the choir together, whatever that is together, and now your family is in this situation. And the only people that can help you are wealthy Christians in your own church, but they either refuse to help you or they charge you interest on a loan. Watch. And so desperate are you for food that you would even take that loan only to put food in the belly of your wife, children, and family members. Do you know how desperate that situation is to know that you can't even pay that loan back? But for the sake of knowing that I got to feed my family, man, I take out this loan. Man, that is a painful existence for these brothers and sisters. For me, it reminded me of a very real story when my wife was pregnant with our second child. She was nursing the first child and her milk dried up. Well, I remember this clear as day. We're sitting there in a tiny little apartment in Durham, North Carolina, and she starts crying because no more milk is coming out of her breasts. And now Malachi now starts crying because he can't receive any milk. And I remember, man, our kitchen was bare. I had just lost my job. We were struggling to make ends meet. Man, it was hard times for us, right? I remember going out on the back deck of my apartment and looking out into the sky and crying because I felt less of a man because I couldn't properly prepare or couldn't properly provide for my family. Then I thought to myself, man, I can't just sit here and suffer. I got to do something about this, right? I remember going out of my house and said, Lena, I'll be right back. I walked down the street to Walgreens, and I went to the back of Walgreens, and I was staring at the Similac and the Good Start in the back of Walgreens. And I remember standing there crying, knowing that my kid is at home crying, and I can't even afford to buy my kid any other milk or any food. And I remember the clerk looked at me, and she said, young man, what's wrong with you? I said, I have a wife at home And I have a little baby who's crying, and I can't afford to buy him any food. And she said, how many cans do you need? I said, maybe just one or two would help. And she bought me the cans of Good Start. I remember walking home with them cans of Good Start, saying, man, this woman was, I don't even know if she was saved. I don't even know if she loved Jesus. But she had enough compassion in her heart 
to see somebody in their place of vulnerability and need, and she was moved with compassion to help. It's crazy that a stranger would do that for me. And in my lifetime, I couldn't find that inside God's house. I think about times my wife and I have been desperate and couldn't find help inside of God's house. I think about times, man, we didn't have, man, we were choosing between food and trying to put gas in the car and couldn't find help inside of God's house. And just imagine now you actually go to talk to somebody and they will only help you as they watch exploit you in the process. It is a painful thing to be exploited. Don't nobody know what that feels like. It is a painful thing to be vulnerable and be exploited. That's why it is a deplorable thing to see these women trapped in these cycles of using their bodies for all these things, especially right here in Atlanta. And you don't have to say amen, and you don't have to agree, but it is deplorable to see our women, our daughters, our sisters trapped in that thing, being exploited by men on tables with dollars. It is a deplorable thing. It is the trick of the devil to make us feel like that's good. I've been in the bar, the bar, the bar, and I know some of us love that. It is deplorable for us to exploit women that way. They are not bodies for services. They are daughters of the Most High God, created in His image. They have worth and value. I don't even know why I'm on this. That's why every time I drive by the bar, the bar, the bar, I always pray that God will shut it down and that He would save and deliver all those women. That he would deliver those men from their debauchery. That he would bring home husbands and business people out of that place. No, I pray like that every time I drive by a strip club. Why? Because those are women with worth and value. Being exploited by the emptiness and the lust of men who used to be just like me. It is painful to be exploited. And then go home feeling like you have no sense of worth and value. And maybe I'm the only one that knows what that feels like. Nobody in this room has ever been exploited in a place of vulnerability. I know what it is to be taken advantage of when I am weak. And that pain is multiplied when it comes from those who you expect to have the same virtues and values as the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought we had the same Bible. I thought we had the same spirit. I thought we heard the same sermon. I thought we had the same pastor. I thought we had the same God. And now these Jews find themselves in a desperate situation. Why? They are struggling because of inequality, taxes, interest rates, and exploitation. How relevant is the Bible? Miss that. They are struggling because of inequality, taxes, interest rates, and exploitation. Like high interest rates in some community is called exploitation. Don't nobody want to talk to me because we don't read and we don't know nothing about that. They're struggling because of inequality, high taxes, interest rates, and exploitation. And now what we see is a fracture in fellowship and the rise of an evil friction. We see the beginning of a very serious conflict. We see the damage of what happens when relationships become transactional. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. I don't want friends like that. You don't want friends like that. You need friends that will ride or die if they got nothing back from you that is material. Yes, it should be mutual grace. But the motive should not be I will do if you will do. The motive is I will do because I love. I want friends around me who will do because they love. I'll help you with this. You don't need to pay me back. I'll give you this. You don't need to pay me back. I'll bless you with this. You don't need to pay me back. Your payment to me is to see you flourish on the backside of this blessing. That's why when I talk to men like Marquavius, Jermaine, Jeremy, some of these young men that I pour into, they always tell my pastor, how can I honor you? Their honor for me is to see them flourish. That if they take the advice that I give them and put it into practice, and I see their lives flourish, that is the greatest gift they can give me. I don't want mentors that are trying to manipulate. 
And I don't want friends that manipulate. I don't want people around me who are manipulators. I want people who are agape givers. Whoa. Whoa. Preach, Philip. I'm trying to. I want people around me who are agape givers. They love with no strings attached. You know who keeps strings? Puppeteers keep strings. Don't put me on your string. Love me because you was first loved. I got my reward for helping you on the cross. I got my reward for helping you on the cross. And the issue is less about conflicts, but more about how we resolve them. Because conflicts will happen, and actually sometimes they are healthy and for our good. So Nehemiah now is facing internal conflict amongst Jewish brothers and sisters. How should they respond to that? How did Jesus, your Lord and my Lord, teach us to respond to conflict? Right? He, notice he didn't leave that to chance for us. But he made sure before he left this earth, he gave us some instructions on how we should handle conflict. Why? Because he knew it will always happen until he returned. So Matthew, who was one of the eyewitnesses of his life and ministry, recorded a conversation in which Jesus taught them how to handle conflict in verse, Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. You know what that is? Don't be passive. Go and show him his fault. Watch. Just between the two of you. So he tells you who should be involved in the conflict when it starts. Not you and a group. Not you and Instagram. Not you and Facebook. Not you and Twitter. Not you and group me. Not you and email. Not you and your small group. He said, when you enter into conflict with your brother and sister, the first step is to address that person how? Privately. Watch. Alone. Why? Because Jesus, who is wiser than you and I, know that if we do it that way and it's healthy, we protect people from the catastrophic injuries of gossip and discord, which God says he hates discord. And I try to stay away from things God says he hates. He says, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. Notice who was involved in the offense. Only two people were in private. Now watch. Let me make a disclaimer for all you sensitive people in the room. This is not a command of God to attack people every time you get hurt. Because if every time we get hurt, we got to have a conversation, we're going to be having too many conversations. Mature believers know how to absorb pain and take it to God. You have to be discerning to know what conflicts are worthy of fighting and what conflicts you take to God on your knees. Some things are so petty, they're not worth a conversation. And some things are so small, watch this, you give people grace. Because watch, we're all in a process of sanctification and growth. So sometimes people hurt you, you just leave it alone. Other times, watch, it must be resolved. So this is for the times it must be resolved. That is, we can't let this fester because we have too much friction. But what if they don't listen to you when you talk to them in private? Jesus in his wisdom tells us what to do next. Step two, but if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you so that in every matter there may be established in the testimony of two witnesses. So he says that so every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, pause. He says if they don't listen to you in private, you bring two or three people along with you. The wisdom says you must choose those two or three people wisely. If I'm dealing with conflict, I don't bring petty people with me into conflict. If I'm dealing with conflict, I don't bring people who are led by their flesh into conflict. If I'm dealing with conflict, I don't bring people who don't know how to process feelings into conflict. You must bring people who watch this, non-biased, non-judgmental, who won't, feel, who won't make you feel ashamed 
and who have, watch this, the wisdom and heart to lead you right in that conflict. Watch. Everybody look at me. When people are healthy, this is where all conflict should end. Between friends, between people in a church, between married couples, even if that help is a counselor. This is where conflict should end. Right here. It should never go past this. We should never get to the back half of Matthew 18. The back half of Matthew 18 should be far and few in between. It should happen once or twice or maybe never in the lifetime of a church. When we are mature, God help us. And when we are healthy, this is where all conflict amongst brothers and sisters should end. Private conversations and mutual people for the sake of, watch this, mediation. But if it ever goes past that, which it should never, Jesus gives a third measure for dealing with conflict. Verse 17, and if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, which is your leaders. And if he refuses to even listen to the church, he says you must treat that person who you have conflict with like a pagan or a tax collector. Now, that doesn't mean nothing to you because you don't know about pagans and tax collectors. A pagan in the day of Jesus was someone the Jews was told to stay away from. Tax collectors were despised, have nothing to do with them. So here it is. Jesus says, if you can't resolve conflict with someone, their heart is so hardened, they won't listen to you. They won't listen to group people. They won't even listen to leaders or church. He says, listen, disconnect yourself from that person. Have nothing to do with them. You just turn them over to the Lord. Now, you think if we do that, that's harsh. This is what your Lord commanded you to do. Why? Because at this point, a person's heart is toxic. It will either corrupt you and others, or you protect yourself from it. So he says, have nothing to do with people in this state. Let God deal with them. He can bring them back to a place of conversation. So notice the direction of conflict resolution. Conflict comes, we go to a person private, not a group, not gossip, not discord, not social media. Then we bring confidence. Then we go to spiritual leadership. That is the biblical direction of resolving conflict. The text says in Nehemiah 5.1, now the men and their wives, watch this, raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Now, this is hazy in the text, this word against. I'm not sure from my study if they went to these Jewish brothers directly. I'm not sure if they went to other people. I don't know who they raised their cry against. I'm not sure if they talked to anybody else, but what we do know is that they raised their cry against their Jewish brothers and sisters. That is, some of y'all are wealthy. We are struggling in poverty. There is a famine. We can't feed our children. I mean, it's so bad. I've given my children away to social services so that they can work to earn wages. Please help us. Don't exploit us. They cried out, man. This is beyond what we can handle. This is the cry of a great conflict. The confrontation, verse 6. This is powerful. Everybody watch. When I, this is powerful, Nehemiah, watch this, heard the outcry of these charges, I was very, he said, angry. And you thought anger was bad. No, watch. Look at me, my brothers and sisters. All anger is not bad. That's why Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, he said to what? Be angry, but sin not. That is, some anger is warranted because we're human beings. And watch, if you really have the love of Jesus in your heart, some things should make you angry. I call it righteous indignation. Injustice should make us angry. Mockery of God should make us angry. Exploitation of brothers and sisters should make us angry. Persecution of our brothers and sisters in other nations should make us angry and move us what? To prayer and compassion. So Nehemiah was angry. Watch. And watch Nehemiah's response to the people. He said, watch, I pondered them in my mind. So he saw the conflict. He paused and he thought about the conflict. Because sometimes when you're in conflict, you can't just open your mouth. You need to take time to think and process what you're feeling. Oh, my God. 
You know, people who are drunk with feelings often make bad decisions. I taught myself a lesson many years ago. I never make major life decisions while I am emotional. Let me just tell you straight up. Do, I shouldn't say do not. Let me suggest to you that you don't make major life decisions when you are emotional. Marriage, divorce, buying a car, buying a home, dealing with a relationship, leaving a business, leaving a church. You don't make major life decisions when you are emotional. Nehemiah was angry and the first thing he did was wait. Man, this is so powerful. He processed how he felt. Then the scripture says, then I, watch, accused the nobles and officials. This is powerful. I know you're not going to like this. And I told them, this is not passivity. This is called confrontation. Godly confrontation. Look what he says to them, quotation mark. You are exacting usury, which is unfair taxes and interest from your own countrymen. Everybody watch the text. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now, you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us? You know what they felt in that moment? Conviction. How do we know that? The text tells us their response. They kept quiet because they could not find anything to say. You know, that's called conviction. My brothers and sisters, as much as we run from it, conviction is a good thing. And it'll keep us on the right track. It will keep us from making bad decisions. I thank God that I be convicted. Let me help some of you. Conviction is a sign to you that your heart is still sensitive to the spirit of God. The more dangerous place is when you're trapped in conflict, you know you're wrong. And you don't feel no conviction. That is a more dangerous thing. Because that tells us your heart has drifted to a place of being hardened or almost being reprobate. You so bent on holding on to your wrong that you can't even feel the conviction of God's spirit. If God can't rein you in. If the spirit of God can't rein you in, what If the spirit of God can't rein you in, what help is there for those who are involved in that conflict? Side note from the text. Stare at the text. There are two principles here. For anyone who has your own business or you're a leader or you're in relationships or you're married or especially parents, just, just two principles I just want to throw out there for you. You can't address what you don't know. Nehemiah addressed this because of an outcry. There's some parents, you spend all your time ignoring your children. They locked up in rooms on cell phones. You don't even know what's going on. You don't even know their hearts are embroiled in conflict, but you can't address what you don't know. You got to watch some of the things they do. There are outcries that they need help. Sometimes people do things and we don't realize what they're really doing is crying out for help. That's why leaders, business owners, people who lead, you should be able to be open to hear what's going on in the ground in your organization. If you so, uh, give me that camera. Give me that camera. Come on, give, give me that camera. Give me that camera. Give me that camera. Give me that camera. Come on. Come on, Rosa. Give me that camera. Everyone watching this message, pastors, business leaders, entrepreneurs, people with employees. If you lead like you are the Wizard of Oz, locked up in a box, and you don't want anyone to tell you what's going on in your organization, you will be in trouble. We need to have enough security in our hearts to hear there are things going on around us that need to be addressed. So we can pray, or we can have conversations, or we can have meetings. You need a pipeline a feedback, or you need people around you who can tell you this happened last week. We need to address this. It's why every Tuesday, our staff, we do SWATs, and we go over every Sunday. We talk about everything that was bad, good, or indifferent. The sound was bad. They missed this cue. 
They didn't start this on time. This was broken in the lobby. We do this every Tuesday to make adjustments. We need to hear that even when it hurts us. A second principle is you cannot resolve what you won't confront. Yeah. You got this problem in the relationship, this problem in the marriage, this problem in the bed. You think it's just going to go away. It's just going to evaporate. Your child is just going to get better. No, they're a sinner. That's why they need to be trained into righteousness. Oh, you think bad behavior is just cute. Oh, little Timmy, he's so cute that he cuss you out and stand on the table at, at Olive Garden. No, that's not cute. You got to confront that. Little Bashim cussing you out in the Chinese restaurant, and you say, oh, he, that's just a phase. No, it's not a phase. You need to train him out of that. The scripture says, train up children in the way that they should go, not trust them to train themselves. And so we have to let the word train us up in the way that we should go and not train up ourselves. Don't train yourself by your own opinions. Don't train yourself by your feelings. Don't train yourself by the things you re- Train yourself up by the word. Come again, angel, even if, even if it hurts. Verse 9, watch. So I continued. I thought the meeting was over. No, 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 no. No, I got some more to say. This is called godly leadership. Verse 9, what you are doing is not right. Now, that hurts. My question to you, can somebody tell you what you're doing is not right? Because there's two things happening in this conflict. There's Nehemiah addressing it and people hearing it. We know what he's saying, but I want to ask, what are you feeling? Can someone tell you you are not right? Can someone tell you your stuff stinks? Can someone tell you you're too big for your britches? Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? Here it is. Here it is. He's saying, listen, shouldn't you think about how your behavior is going to bring embarrassment to the God you said you serve? Why? You got people watching you on social media, in your family. They all know you are super Christian. Shouldn't you think about how you talk and how you behave so you don't bring embarrassment and shame to the Lord Jesus Christ? I know this hurts, but it's a text. He said you should think twice so you don't bring reproach upon God. Why? Because we got to remember that we are witnesses and the things we do and say point to another person. Some people don't want nothing to do with God, not because God is not good, because his people are not good. Yeah, some people don't want nothing to do with the church because people in the church are nasty. Don't nobody care how good I preach. Were the people friendly when they came through the door? That's why we got a welcome team out there and train them to speak and smile. Speak and smile. Because they don't care how good I preach if they was nasty. Don't nobody care how good I preach. If people are nasty, they out. Watch, let me ask you a question. Is the fear of the Lord an accountability for you? There's some things I don't do because I fear God. There's some places I don't go because I fear God. There's some things I don't post because I fear God. There's some things I don't put on my story because I fear God. There's some people I don't hang out with because I fear God. There's some things you're just not going to see me involved in because I fear God. And there's some text messages I will send saying I'm sorry. Because, because I fear God. Verse 10, I and my brothers and my men, this is good, everybody watch this, are also lending to the people. So now we see the leader being a servant leader. The leader is involved in helping. Can I say something to leaders? If leaders, if you are above serving, then leadership is beneath you. If serving is above you, then leadership is beneath you. Ooh, then, ooh. If you're too good to serve and help, then you're not good enough to be in leadership. Because the greatest leader of all said, I did not come to be served, 
but to, but to serve and to give myself as a ransom. I get tired of seeing all these bougie leaders that can't get their cuticles dirty. You can't pick up a piece of trash in your own gathering? You too good to pick up something in the bathroom? Or you too good to say sorry? Or you too good to be in the meeting? Or you too good to serve? That's a poor example of leadership. The last time I checked, leadership was not a title or a position. It was influence and a lifestyle. Four people agree. I don't know what kind of leaders you're running after. I thought I'd have 500 people that might agree. Leadership is not a title. It is influence and a lifestyle. It is a person that lives by example. So listen to what he said to them. Almost done. Look at me. He said, give back to them immediately. (laughs) Resolve this win. Now, he said, give them back their fields. Give them back their vineyards. Give them back their olive groves and houses. And also the usury, the the interest. You are charging them at the hundred pounds a month. He said, grain and wine. He said, give it all back. So he said, watch. Do this and resolve this conflict. How should they respond? How do you respond? How do we respond? With attitude, with anger, with rage, with frustration, with excuses, with rejection, with flight. I want to hold on to my offense. How did the hearers of Nehemiah respond? I love the Bible. I love the scriptures. Verse 12. We will give it back, period. Watch, it didn't take a second meeting. It didn't take a series of meetings. It took one godly confrontation, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and a, watch, self-revelation that I am in the wrong. You know what? I don't need to drag this on. I don't need to hurt any more people. I don't need to keep hurting my fellow Jews. So the wealthy Jews said, you know what? I'm done right here. We will give it back. He says, and we will not demand anything from them anymore. We will do as you say, Nehemiah. Then I summoned the priests, and I made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. Now, this is so powerful. Let me finish the text. I also shook out the folds of my robe, which is an Old Testament sign of putting a cursing on somebody. He said, quote, in this way, may God shake out of his house and his possessions every man who does not keep his promises. That is, if you don't keep your word, may God deal harshly with you. So much a man may be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, we don't want no parts of that. We said, amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did exactly as they promised. So we don't want no parts of that. That whole putting a cursing on me, well, you're going to turn me over to God? Listen, you would rather me deal with you than God deal with you. You would rather man deal with you than God deal with. It's one thing to deal with a tough meeting. It's another thing to fall into the hands of a wrathful God. You better stop that nonsense before God gets a hold of you. Watch. This is so powerful. Watch the text. Watch the text. He shook out his garment against him. Watch the text. Nehemiah said in essence, watch the text. Your sorry is not good enough. Oh, my God. Watch the text. Look at the text. He said, your sorry is not good enough. We're going to take your apology and we're going to create accountability. Because sometimes some things are so egregious that I'm sorry is not good enough. In order to make sure you don't do this again, we need to create accountability. Because your words doesn't always keep you from repeating bad behavior. Oh my God. Preach, Philip. I'm trying. Sometimes your words do not keep you or prevent you from repeating bad behavior. Side note, preach, Philip. Proverbs says, like a dog who returns to his vomit, so is a person that keeps going back to their folly. You keep doing this, you keep stirring up strife, you keep being in gossip, you keep being in discord, you keep posting on social media. You're like a dog that keeps going back to its vomit. When do you learn? So watch, Nehemiah did not put it on them to just say, I'm sorry. This is so profound. 
He said, I take your sorry, but now I give you accountability. If you do this again, may God shake you out of his blessings. Side note, watch the text. Um, listen to me. No one, not a pastor, not a leader, no one should set themselves above reproach, I'm sorry, and accountability. No one should ever be above accountability. If you cannot be held accountable, then you cannot be trusted. Let me help some of you. There are some of you who believe in God to use you in certain ways, but he can't yet because you can't be trusted. Because you don't, you don't listen to the word and you don't follow his spirit. So he can't release to you greater assignments because you are a risk to him. People who can be trusted are people who can handle accountability. So if you can't handle accountability, you cannot be trusted. Watch. You are dangerous when you cannot be held accountable. If people can't keep you accountable, if policies can't keep you accountable, if God can't keep you accountable, you are a dangerous person. How can God trust you with a greater assignment when he can't trust you with his word? And some of us don't even realize the only thing stopping the thing that you're believing for from unlocking is your ability to be submitted to the Holy Spirit and the word. Like we really think we could beg God into doing things for us when we have not shown that we could be held accountable. And let me help some people in this room. Look right at me. The greatest accountability is not your pastor. Ooh. The greatest accountability is not your parent. The greatest accountability is not even a, a policy, a manual, or a procedure. The greatest accountability is the person above you. The greatest accountability is self-accountability. It's my ability to change my ways because I know that God is tapping me in this area. No one needs to tell me I'm wrong. I feel the Spirit of God telling me I'm wrong. If that can't hold me accountable, I am a dangerous person. I can't be trusted. So watch, Nehemiah did not leave it to these Jews to be trusted. He said, I hear you're sorry. Watch, watch, everybody look at me. But we need also accountability in addition to your apology. This is like a wife or husband who says, I hear you're sorry, but now I need you to do this now going forward. How did they respond? With repentance. They responded with repentance. We must learn to be accountable. Some big statements I wrote. I'm about to give you two of them. The first one is this. True statement. Relational conflicts are inevitable. But how we respond to them really displays our character. You know what God has taught me? Some of the things that I think are painful are really just tests. To see how I respond. You never know what kind of tea bag you have until you put it in hot water. And we don't even realize. Some of us be praying for God to strengthen our character, perfect our character. And his answer to that is conflict. Your character is not going to be perfected on a mountaintop. Your character is going to be perfected in valleys. Conflict. Hardship. Lack. Opportunities to make bad decisions are tests to shape character. Relational conflict is inevitable, but how we respond to them really puts our character on display. You want to put your character on TV? Let me put you on conflict and see how you respond. Now we know what's in you. Man. Hey, you can talk a good game and live a good game until your tea bags slip into hot water. Then once that tea bag slip into hot water, we find out if you're green tea or rotten tea. We find out if you can heal or if you make sick. Wow. 
And so some of you are afraid now. You want to stay away from praying, asking God to perfect your character. No, there's some doors that won't unlock until your character is changed. And so it's like school. Do you want to stay in high school forever or do you want to go on to the next level? Sometimes the next level requires, watch, perfection of character in some area. So, for example, when I was a school teacher, I was praying for God to help me to be more patient. Big mistake. Oh, my Lord. I was only saved for a couple months, and nobody taught me. Listen, I was praying God teach me to be more patient. I thought it was God was going to tap me while I was asleep, and I was going to be more patient. Why? Because where I came from, I had anger issues, and I still do. No. I, listen. There is a person being sanctified on the stage. I still deal with low-grade anger. Right? But it was really bad. Like, I was violent. And I remember I'm praying God to give me patience. And I was, a, I was a school teacher, and I worked with a guy in a room, and we taught children with autism for two years. And I remember one time he and I got into a fight, a, a verbal match in an office, and I, and I bawled my fists to swing on him in a doorway. And another teacher grabbed me as I swung and broke up the fight. Watch. And I'm, I'm three months into my, Christian, my salvation. I'm supposed to be representing Jesus in the school, and I'm swinging on another teacher. This is a true, swinging on another teacher. Watch. It took me years later to look back on that and realize what God was trying to perfect in me. Was Patience. Like when I get trapped in I-75 traffic. Talk about it, Philip. Yes. It is ungodly what happens on I-75. And my wife be checking me because I go off with my horn ministry. Don't nobody know about the horn ministry? Don't nobody know about the horn ministry? It's not... My home ministry is tight. But that's the way we drive in New York. My kids didn't believe that for years. I was telling them that until I took them there. And they said, well, everybody got horn ministry. I said, well, yes. We all are trying to get to where we're going. How long are you going to be sitting here waiting to make this right? There's nobody coming. There ain't nobody coming. Make the darn right. I got to get to work. What are you doing, praying? You in worship? Now is not the time to be in glory. Now is the time to be in a rush. Make the right. Somebody say, make the right. Come on now. Ain't nobody in front of you. There's nobody coming beside you. You got to wait for all five lanes to be clear before you turn into the right lane. Make the right. So conflict displays character. Everybody look at me. Look right at me. But the next statement is even more important. All C's so you can remember them. Conflict can create classrooms or coffins. Conflict can create either classrooms or coffins. We could either learn from conflict and grow by them. Or we could use them to kill things God intended for us to have. So whenever conflict arise and conflict will arise, you decide where you're going to sit down. You're either going to sit down in a classroom and grow and learn, or you're going to sit down in a coffin and let things die. Conflict can create classrooms or coffins. 
And whether you learn or die, or whether you grow or things die, it depends on where you choose to sit. How many, how many things have died in your life because of a conflict because you chose to put yourself in a coffin instead of a classroom? How many relationships have we lost because we put ourselves in a coffin instead of a classroom? How many opportunities have we lost because we put ourselves in a coffin instead of a classroom? How many blessings have we forfeited because we put ourselves in a coffin instead of a classroom? Conflict will create classrooms or coffins and what we experience is contingent upon our hearts and our decisions. Me, Philip Anthony Mitchell, have already buried too many things that I regret when I was immature and did not know how to handle conflict. Now I realize when it happens, it's for my learning and for the perfecting of my character. Let me finish the text. Verse 14 through 17 through 19. Let's finish the text. Moreover, everybody watch now. We talked about the conflict. We saw the confrontation. And now is the consecration. Moreover, I love the scriptures. From the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah. Everybody watch. Until the 32nd year. 12 years he was there as their leader. No, I know my brothers. This is so powerful. Ate the food allotted to the governor. So watch. I know I can do this, but I choose not to. Sometimes the greatest test of maturity is freedom. Everything is lawful, but not everything is expedient. We think handcuffing people is training. Sometimes training is giving them freedom. That's why my wife and I don't make every decision for our teenagers. We watch them to see how they make decisions so we could train them before they leave. That's why I don't micromanage my leaders and my staff. I give them autonomy to make decisions, and if I don't like what they do, then I talk to them. I'm not telling Melissa what songs to choose on Sunday, but I will come and tell her that song was whack. Let's not sing that. It's been a while. while. Melissa's been doing good. Y'all give it up for Melissa. Melissa. (laughs) Can we honor Melissa for elevating the worship culture here at Victory Church? (laughs) Somebody shout Melrose. Melrose. Everybody look at me. I'm landing the plane on this message. Those of you who are leaders, business owners, listen, you don't You don't micromanage people to death. Sometimes freedom is the test of maturity. He said, man, this, I I, could have had all the food, but I chose not to. Everybody watch. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, they placed heavy burdens on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from the additions of food and wine. The assistants also, everybody look, lauded it over the people. But out of the reverence of God, I did not act like that. So his accountability was God. He said, watch, I know I could have did that, but I chose not to because God was my accountability. How many times have we stopped ourselves and said, I could do this, but I choose not to because God is my accountability. Instead, I, watch this, everybody watch, verse 16, devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. I did not acquire any land. That is, no matter what the conflict was going on, Nehemiah said, I stayed devoted to the work of God. Let's, let's finish. So he showed what a servant leader is like. Let's finish the verse. I'm done, Frank. Furthermore, 150 Jews, that's a big staff, sat at my table, as well as those who came for us from the surrounding nations. Each day they gave an ox and six choices of sheep and poultry and all this good food. And he said, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were too heavy on the people. So that is, I didn't lead in such a way as to unnecessarily hurt the people under me. And then I love how he finished the the chapter, verse 19. (laughs) 
I feel him right here. He said, Lord, remember me with favor. Oh, my God. For all I have done for these people. That is a silent cry of leaders who give everything for people even when they are taking knives at the same time. This is not a cry for Nehemiah to get more from God. We read the text wrong. This is the cry of a man who's tired, weary and frustrated. A man who's focused on the cause that's much bigger than the conflict. Community, cause, conflict. Focus on the cause more than the conflict. We hear the prayer of a man fighting for a people. We hear the prayer of a man fighting for a cause. We hear the prayer of a man who sees the bigger picture. We see the prayers of a man who acted in good faith with a right heart. Nehemiah knew that to promote the welfare of these Jews was to promote the glory of God because their success represented the reputation of God. Man, I think about conflict in my own home with my own wife when we have heated fellowships. We don't argue. We have heated fellowships. And at times when we be at, be at beef with one another, I'll be in my man cave, she'll be upstairs, man. And at some point in time, man, we've grown to realize, you know what, this is the devil. And this is our flesh. I've learned maybe 95% of conflict in churches is rooted in the flesh. And the devil. And my wife and I, man, some of us, man, sometimes we be there and we break out of that conflict. Say, I say, you know what? This is the devil. And some of us, we, my wife and I, we break that silence with a text and some emojis. Man, I love you, girl. What you doing? Come down here, watch this game with me. I'm in the bathroom. You come up here and watch me put this mask on my face. And we break that, we break that, that, that tension with, with a conversation and some emojis of love. Other times if we're in the same room, we be in the room and we can feel the tension. And I just walk up to her and I'll tap something or I'll jiggle something or I'll shake something. Yep. All my married couples, I'm trying to throw one in for you for free. You just tap something, jiggle something, something poke out. Yo, it's hard to be mad when something come alive. It's hard to be mad when things come alive. That break that mad quick. When things come alive, we say, let's go resolve this in another way. And sometimes Lena be mad, and I come in there, I come, I tap something, jiggle something, move something, grab something, something come alive, I come alive, and listen to beef. We ain't got time to be mad. No. We are active. We don't got time to be mad. I'm attracted to my wife. I don't got to pray in tongues to get into my room. I look at her. I meditate and I'm ready to go. And listen, and sometimes we be in beef and we tap that things. Watch. And other times we be in friction and it'd be close to my preaching Sunday morning. And my wife would come and say, honey, let's just resolve this because I know you got to preach. And I know God can't hear your prayers if you remain in conflict with me. So the mature wife comes and she reconciles with me so I can preach to you. And everybody look right at me. Look right at me. I speak to every friend. I speak to every married couple. I speak to every person in the Christian community. You can have fellowship or you can have friction, but you cannot have both at the same time. You have to choose which one you want to experience. So how should we finish this message? How about with the words of one of the best friends of Jesus? Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 3. He said this, he said, finally... All of you live commandment in harmony with one another. He said, be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble because pride keeps conflict going. 
Verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. That's immature. But with blessing. Because to this you were called. That's powerful. Watch. You were called to be in harmony. Ever thought about that? How about that? Harmony is a calling. Where all the husbands and wives are. Harmony is a calling. Where all the friends at. Harmony is a calling. Watch. That you may watch inherit blessing. That means sometimes they stop when we stay in conflict. So then he quotes Psalm 34 next. Four. Whoever would love life and see good days. If you would have a good life. If you would have good days. If you would see the best that God has for you. He says control one thing. He will keep his tongue from evil and his lips from God. Why? Because James, the brother of Jesus, your mouth will set things on fire. Your mouth will burn down relationships, burn down opportunities, burn down churches, burn down friends, burn down marriage. Your uncontrolled, untamed mouth. Your gossipy, discord mouth. Your cursing not blessing, unprayerful mouth. You talk too much mouth. Your fingers on social media that are extensions of your mouth. He said if you want to live life and have good days, control your tongue. Keep your lips from speech. Last part of the verse. He must turn from evil and do good. I like this part. He must seek peace and pursue it. You know what that means? That means peace sometimes could be lost. And he says, when you lose peace, you got to go back and get it. Sometimes, man, we go to sleep and don't rest. He says, you got to seek peace and pursue it. You got to run after peace. When you have conflict, you got to seek to have peace, is what happened in Nehemiah chapter 5. In marriages, in friendships, in churches, a mature people seek peace. Peace. They don't keep conflict and strife going. That's immature and it's ungodly character. And when peace is lost, angel, he said, don't leave it out there. You know what he said? Go get it. You can have fellowship with others or you can have friction, but you cannot have both at the same time. What you experience is your choice. Choose the former because the latter is far more painful and destructive. Let's have fellowship. <clears throat> Eternal God and of a wise father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the weight and the seed of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the principles you preserved through time and experience in the lives of others for our learning and for our... We truly hope this message resonated with you and encouraged you in Christ. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please support the spread of the gospel by visiting us online and choosing the giving option that works best for you. And again, thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next week.